want to take a walk, gentlemen. Let's we'll see what you got. <laughs> should, I, should I be scared right now? So we're here in East Port of Spain, Trinidad. And when people think of Trinidad, usually they think of steel pan drums, carnival, celebrations, and good times. And Trinidad itself is a pretty rich country. They've got plenty of oil and gas deposits, and the GDP per capita here is 18,000. Unfortunately, over the past 15 years, Trinidad sees murder rate go from about 100 a year to 500 a year. And that's mostly due to warring gang factions in neighborhoods below me like Laventille, which fight ruthless turf wars, sometimes over just one block. So how did these gangs get so powerful? Many of them have gotten intertwined in politics, doing favors for politicians and receiving lucrative government contracts for public works and construction projects meant to help alleviate unemployment. Adding to that, Trinidad is only seven miles away from Venezuela. In the past few years, it has re-emerged as a major transshipment point for drugs to West Africa and the United States. Border Patrol officers say they found 700 and 32 pounds worth of cocaine. A recent bust in Virginia had over $100 million worth of cocaine that originated in Trinidad. So much cocaine, we can't even tell you where we shot this video. While the drugs only stop in Trinidad temporarily, the guns brought in as protection stay. Many on the island think that corrupt politicians and business leaders are heavily involved. And they say that this culture of corruption and impunity filters down to the street level where gangs do not fear the rule of law. We're on our way to meet Hal Greaves, a former actor now turned community activist who works with a lot of the local gangs. He's one of the few people who can move throughout all territories. Hal, where are we right now? We're in Canada, and this community has been devastated by the recent fighting between the gangs. Um, several of the families have been moved out. The buildings have been condemned. We could see where walls have been broken down. There are bullet holes all throughout the community. There was one gang there, and some years ago, the gang broke into almost five factions, and with murderous rage. And the boys will tell you that now, the kitchen is at war with the bedroom. And the hate they had for people who they grew up among, they, they shared the same house. Almost once a week, they'll be shooting in the area. And the government's just powerless to stop it. They're not powerless, they're just not focused. The government has tried a number of tools to stop the violence, including curfews and anti-gang legislation passed in 2011 that carries a possible jail sentence of 20 years just for being in a gang. Most of the responsibility, though, falls on Trinidad's embattled police force, who have been criticized recently for extrajudicial killing and overaggressive policing. We went to meet up with the Northeast Division Task Force. So this is an Uzi that these guys pulled off a, a gangster about two nights ago. There was a shootout and they killed two people. We're, uh, we're about to go on patrol with the Northeast Division Task Force in Trinidad, Port of Spain. Uh, from what we're told, they're sort of the baddest cops out there right now. Um, and this is why, because they pull this off people that shoot at them. Our guide was Inspector Roger Alexander a large man with a fearsome reputation, well known as an officer not to be trifled with. So we've been at the police station for about five minutes. Uh, they're saying it was basically a quiet night. A call just went over, a guy got shot six times. So we're heading out right now with the task force to see what's going on. It's routine. Yes, stand by. So right now you'll see the place look very dismal. Everybody look up. It's crazy though, it's Friday night and there's and nobody, nobody. Exactly. nobody on the streets. Anything could happen here. Anything. <laughs> hmm? Which one? Oh, yeah. You can see the shells right there. One there, look one, one there. there too. Yeah. Well, you know my days, Blood over here. Yeah. Right at the scene of a shooting that just happened. Um, we heard over the speaker that the guy was shot six times, blood and shells everywhere. Uh, it's pretty tense around here. We're being told not to get too close. Um, but the inspector is a large man, and I'm going to hide behind him uh, in case anything happens. So what happened? I mean, how do these gangs just take control like this? Just... Money? Drugs? Yeah. Two of war? 
there are some people calling themselves Rasta City. Yeah. And some is the Muslims. Rasta City have a problem with the Muslims over drug turf. So they're killing out each other. Back and forth, back and forth, back and yeah, forth. Back and forth. Some people in the area, in some of the areas, consider themselves community leaders. But them, those community leaders say about getting jobs for the youths, um, building construction in the area to help the youths and the government employment. contracts. Exactly. Yeah. But what happened too is that um, instead of treating with only that, they also want to treat with the narcotic aspect of the thing. These government contracts for programs originally created as a means of sharing Trinidad and Tobago's oil and gas wealth have backfired and given way to corruption, working to strengthen the very gangs the government is trying to rein in. It's making our job nine times harder. Because long time, when we knew all they had was, was drugs and, and guns, and they used to come out and do robberies, and we used to catch them. But how do you catch a man now who's getting legal money? It is a little more difficult. It's easy to hide, too. Yeah. Does it feel sometimes like, like you're fighting a losing battle? Yeah. yeah. Honestly, yeah. The police are frustrated in this country because the crime rate is going up. Uh, public confidence in policing is at an all-time low. Um, police don't get the kind of respect that they, they would hope for in a country. And a lot of times the police have been fingered in a lot of um, sort of unsavory practices as well. The traditional methods of law enforcement aren't working as quickly. They're not coming up with much that's innovative and, and creative. And there's a certain level of frustration. So what we see at the end of the day sometimes is that uh, the criminals are pretty much shot dead instead of going through the work to bring them in alive, to prosecute them and to probably get that information to beef up your intelligence, to really um, decimate the kind of organizations and criminal units you're seeing on the street. We're not seeing that. So I guess shooting criminals and, you know, dead has become the easy way out for law enforcement. The inspector wanted to show us the house where his men killed two alleged gangsters the night before, smack dab in the front lines of a raging gang war. This area, yeah? If you come here any day, you might, from the time you reach here, you'll see people running all over the place, right? They know we kind of know nonsense around here too, so they don't take much chances with us. So would you come here by yourself in this car, or you'd only come with two or three other police officer cars with you? Who, me? Yeah. <laughs> I might come by myself. <laughs> Other cops, other other normal cops, would they come here by themselves? Nah. Never, huh? They ain't coming here. All right, let me see. You stop there. Going up there. Come on, take a walk, gentlemen. Let's see what you got. <laughs> should, I, should I be scared right now? We're at the borderline 11 Hill. Um, sort of this dividing line where there's gang war between the Muslims and Rasta City. And uh, this is close to where there was a shootout a few days ago. Ooh, I'm out of breath. This is the hills right here, this high ground. The officer's foot went through here. Yeah. While the gunfight going, all right? What the? Yeah. Your foot went through there? So they put the gun through there and started firing yeah. at you? Jesus, it's a mess over yeah, here. Yeah, right? right? So the officer came here. Shot, yeah. shot, boom, boom, exchange. Your foot gone through the hole. Swa! He ended up kind of low. So the next man had to come over him, the one. Started dealing with it. That's your foot. Yeah, there's bullet holes all over here. Uh, a lot of <laughs> blood still flies buzzing around, fresh blood, thick. Whenever we ask people about what happened to change Trinidad into such a violent place where people are willing to take on the police, most traced it to one event that changed the country forever. In 1990, Trinidad was home to the only attempted militant Islamic overthrow of a government in the Western Hemisphere. They say that after the coup in 1990, it was sort of a wake up point for a lot of people uh, in these communities that the government had no control and the way to solve a problem was with guns, not with talking. That coup affected the nation, the society on a whole, physically, psychologically, and otherwise. It, 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 it really damaged the place and it would have set the trend that, you know what? If you have a problem, let's take on the forces. Let's take on the government. Let's hold them at bay. It showed the weakness. It showed the weakness. And when, when weakness is exposed, many people take advantage of weakness. On July 27, 1990, a man named Abu Bakr, the leader of an Islamic group called Jamato Muslimin, 
and 115 of his followers violently took over TV stations and government buildings, including the parliament, and laid siege to the country for six days. At 6 p.m. this afternoon, the government of Trinidad and Tobago was overthrown. 24 people were killed in the chaos, and they even shot the prime minister. Because of an amnesty negotiation, they were freed two years later and have been continuously in trouble since then. We went to Abu Bakr's compound to talk to him about what went wrong in Trinidad. I've been charged for murder. I've been charged for conspiracy to murder. I've been charged for treason. I've been charged for terrorism. I've been charged for guns and ammunition. Nothing has stuck because they just fabricated all these cases against me. We're hearing a lot now that the narco trade here is ramping up a lot. Yes, is it of coming course. from is it coming from politicians? Is it coming from business people? Where is it coming from? Everybody's involved. Everybody's involved. Everybody, the, the, the police, the, everybody's involved. The Coast Guard, everybody's involved. Our next one neighbor, seven miles, is Venezuela. And then right next to Venezuela is Colombia. It's we and right here, this is the transshipment point. Go and look at the affluence in Trinidad. And, and, and you, you know in Brooklyn you can find the affluence that exists in Trinidad, nowhere. And, you know, we saw in the newspaper that the unemployment rate was, was 4%. Uh, do you think that's accurate? No, it's not accurate. Far from being accurate. It's a lie. It's a big lie. There's no single day without a murder or two. Why people would be killing each other if they are, if they, if they are employed? But there was, po there was poverty 20 years ago, you know? And there's, there's poverty now, but you, don't see, you didn't see 500 murders a year 20 years ago. Now you see 500 don't, murders a year. I was in charge. Oh, because you were in charge? I, I'm telling you, I was in charge. Mm -hmm. 20, 20 years ago, before 1990, I was in charge of the ground. Just before 1990, none of the burner rates, none of the murder rates reach 100. Because we cleaned up the drugs, we cleaned up everything. After you go to jail, what happens? You lose power of the streets? Or no, no, we, no, we just left it. You just left the streets? We, we left it. We say, that's where you want? Well, we left it. And that's what's the problem now. We left it. Who's controlling it right now? Controlling what? Who's controlling the streets? It's right out now? of control. Because all the young people just come up after them who don't have the experience of the streets, who didn't have the will to control. I mean, and, and a lot of the people who were the community leaders were, were people who were in our organization. We control the streets. So are we getting better or are we getting worse? It's getting worse every day. This place is going to explode. There is a perpetual quest for dominance. You go to sleep Friday night and the person that was dominant Friday, Saturday morning, they find him dead. And then it starts all over again and the instability starts all over again and the war for power starts all over again. Without Bakker or another strongman in power, different leaders are doing whatever is necessary to assert control over territory and contracts. The gangs have been enshrined in the consciousness of communities. The gangs play a very strategic role when it comes to the distribution of wealth in our communities. And a lot of our communities have felt neglected for a very long time from government. So they're not getting the jobs from government. They're not getting the kind of resources they want from the government. But somehow the gangs seem to be the government in our communities. And in Trinidad and Tobago, they don't call themselves gangs. They see themselves more as community groups, more as organizations, more as community leaders. These are the leaders of the community who are receiving these contracts from government to provide the kind of jobs. Um, it could be a payback for getting the votes as well. They see themselves as business organization, and that business can run from government contracts to drugs. It's whatever is the big business on the street today, and they're going to get involved in that. No business passes them by. We headed to Beatum Gardens, a neighborhood notorious for being a Rasta City stronghold, to talk to Spanish, Beatum's community leader. Some consider him a gang leader, but to a lot of people in the community, he's the only one bringing jobs and social services to the impoverished neighborhood. Spanish, so uh, where are we right now? What's this neighborhood? What's it like? 24th Street, Beatum Gardens. They used to call it Shanty Town in the early, you know. It's, it is class as ghetto, but it's, you know, it's a part of the country, and some of the people might be going through more poverty than normal. It seems like no one's really helping out here, so you're building some houses. Well, I, as much as I could do, I'm a registered contractor. I work hard for what I want. 
Once I get work from the government and thing, I earn money, I spend it into things we could help to employ and, you know, elevate the youth around me. You talk to some of the police and some of the, some of the uh, politicians, yes. and they point to you when they say he's a community leader, but he's a gang leader too. You think that's not fair? No, it can't be fair. I don't know gang leader. I don't order nobody children to go and kill. I don't order nobody children to go and rob or thief or kidnap or nothing of this sort. Yeah, attempts me on my life, you understand, but... How many? Well, to recall, uh, about once, you know. Uh, so, you know, twice. What happened? They came for you They, they came for you in your house or you were driving? No, or... driving, you know, coming out of certain places. Man might stand up and fire shots at the vehicle I drive, you know. Bust about nine or ten shots shoot up the vehicle. And that was, how long ago was that? Uh, last year. Last year, damn. Yeah. And you got people recognize that car, so I imagine you gotta be you gotta be real careful all the time. Yeah, I was driving that, but I don't drive that. So again, I I don't really drive one thing too long. I, but it's all because the, I name Spanish and I live in Vita. You know, somebody from my next community might see me and be done with any people. Have you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? Yeah. So it could happen. If you're from Vita, you're not allowed in certain parts of Trinidad. If you're from Sur, you're not allowed in. Beat me and I'm sure, yes. And what's going on right here? You're, you're, you got turntables, you got speakers, you're putting yeah, on a party well, for the people. Yeah, well, I music, certain thing. Plus, as I work, I buy music, I like that. I grew up in that. Besides bringing jobs, Spanish always puts on events like soccer matches and parties to support his community. place over here, Spanish is actually building this for the people in the community. And uh, it's just a little taste of how these community leaders really take care of their own and why they have so much respect. The party was a really good time. It was clear that there was a lot of love in the community and that everyone took care of each other, almost like a big family. It was easy to forget that this neighborhood was often a war zone and that other gangs sometimes came to these parties and shot them up. Now that we were in with Spanish, we were able to meet some of the guys actually pulling the triggers in these gang wars. What you say in Trinidad when you drink like this? Opa? Opa? No. What you say? Cheers. 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 It's what we say in New York sometimes, ready? L'chaim. L'chaim. It means to life. <laughs> to life. Dreddy, why do you, um, why do you have to carry that around? Why do you feel the need you gotta carry a firearm? I don't know, that to survive you really. You have to defend yourself here in the ghetto. Who are you, who are you defending yourself against? From the hills, man, the men on the hills. Let's fire shots at anybody, anybody, anybody. Anytime? Anytime, any day. No one from on this end can go on that end. And if someone from this end goes to that end, shots get fired? Yeah, yeah that's it, that's it. Done? Done, they finish here. Damn. Have you lost a lot of friends? We, we know the murder rate here yeah, is crazy. A, a, a lot of you know, The last two shots fired, 12, 12, 12 people pick up rapid fire automatic weapons. You know, the police, they're going after the young kids on the streets. The big fish, no one's going after the big fish. No, the big fish don't come, do deal direct. The big fish are what, politicians, businessmen? Them is the men. And they're the ones who are bringing the drugs in too, yeah? Them is the men who behind the curtain. The men behind the curtain? Them hiding. Yeah. Leaving us in the front line. The police now, they owe extra money. They take money? Of course. And what about the drugs and the guns? What is that? It comes from Venezuela? Where does it come from? It comes from Venezuela, which is the politician, and them just get it in much easier. Yeah, we hear that Coast Guard, all them, they just take bribes, yes, the guns, the drugs come in. Yeah, that's how the thing run here in Trinidad now. Well, you can see about 10 years now, you know, the whole thing changed up. Everybody started to take bribe. Coast Guard, police, everybody on the dollar sign. 
And that's when the murder rate started going really, really high. And when the action start. Yeah. Because everybody want a piece in the cake, money changes everything. Yeah. Contracts, money. The long as you have money, well, money is power. It isn't the street guys who are making the serious money in Trinidad. Dreddy said something we kept hearing. Behind the drug trade and the gangs are what Trinidadians call the big fish. The untouchable, nameless elites who treat the country like their own narco state, buy off politicians, and foster endemic corruption that affects all levels of society. To understand the murder rate, to understand the coup, and to understand all the complexities, you must understand the games the politicians have played. Young people are seeing that sometimes our politicians doing again what they want, and they're not seeing any sort of repercussions, any sort of consequences. The reality is, is that the most powerful players who are resident in Trinidad are the illicit drug trade, have then the need to purchase impunity from the state. They have to be political financiers. And that is what drives the endemic corruption of the society. When people speak of corruption in society, all they look at is the most visible means, is the, the lower level ones, the ones who get caught taking a bribe and things like that. The traffickers who live in Trinidad and Tobago, they wield power within the state structure to the extent that Nobody in the state structure can bring them down. They are, in fact, untouchable. Until the authorities in Trinidad are ready to go after the big fish, it doesn't seem like much will change on the ground. Literally, a few thousand people have been killed in these areas. We need help. You think that some of that money that's coming from all the oil that's on the island would trickle down here. But from everything everyone's telling us, it doesn't come down here at all. No, because we don't see here as part of Trinidad. We see here as a saw, a diseased part that we wish would go away. I tell people, if your left kidney is cancerous and you ignore it, it will kill you. If you focus on the parts of your body that are healthy and you say, that left kidney is just a pain and a bother, you're going to die. And the nation is dying because we're treating a part of us as though it will go away and dry up one day.